Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum and welcome to another episode in looking at the personality or person of Jesus Christ or the Prophet Isa peace be upon him as we as Muslims refer to him as. As we saw in the previous episodes, we saw that there are basically so far up to the so far as we've got five points that missionaries, Christians and evangelists use to prove that Jesus Christ is God. The first point that they brought up was that Jesus claimed to be the Son of God. And we looked at all the verses that refer to many other people or many other characters in the Bible also being the sons of God. Now when you bring that point to the mission or the Christian, he's going to say that, well, you see, the word begotten is put in front of Son of God, and that's not used for any other person or any other character in the Bible. Therefore, this proves the first statement. However, we saw that Isaac, if we look at the character of Isaac, that he also was referred to the begotten son. His children were referred to as his begotten son. But we found later that he had another child, and so strictly speaking, that was not his only begotten son. And so the word, that was another argument that was, was pointless. Then the third statement we looked at is that Jesus is God because the Christians claim that he was without a human father. Now a human father, Adam was without a human father, and we saw that that also nullifies it. And therefore it cannot be a statement that can be used to prove with evidence that Jesus is God. And then the fourth point that we looked at is that he called God the Father. And therefore, because Jesus called God the Father, therefore he must be the Son of God or must be God. But this is a statement that many Christians use all the time. Even the Jewish people use it. And we saw that even uh, young people who have a parent who looks after them is not really their parent or a guardian. They call their mother, mother. And they call the person who looks after their father. But nowhere are they biologically mother and father. And then, of course, the fifth point that we were looking at was that Jesus is God because he is called Messiah. Now we understand what the word Messiah means. I mean, the, the word Messiah simply means the anointed one or the appointed one. So the Messiah has nothing to do with some divine origin or divine being. Messiah is just an understanding that it is just anointed person, somebody sent or appointed for a task to do something. Now if we look in the Bible, and I have a Bible here that you should have by now, you must have a Bible so that you can mark it, so you can ask questions to the Christians to explain these things. If we look in Isaiah in the Bible, which is an Old Testament book, uh, chapter 45 and verse 1, we see that there is a man by the name of Cyrus, Cyrus the Persian, and he is called the Messiah. So although modern Bibles try to hold the fact that Jesus was the Messiah, there are many other characters within the Bible that are also known as the Messiah. The Bible verses refer to Jesus as the Messiah, and what happened with the Bible translators, when they came across words like anointed to other people, referring to other people in the Bible, they kept that as the word anointed. But when it came to translating the same word with exactly the same description, when it came to describing Jesus, they changed it to the word Messiah. So even though many of the other verses in the Bible refer to the word anointed should be Messiah, they changed it to anointed, and when it came to Jesus, only Messiah. So there's a double standard going on here, a purposely deceptive tactic to make sure that people are deceived and think that somehow the word anointed and Messiah mean something different from each other. So in this way, they hope to give the impression that there is only one Messiah. But we know this not to be true. There are many Messiahs spoken of in the, in the Bible. So let's move on to the sixth point because we need to move on and, and understand exactly all these decisions that Christians have come to to prove that you know Jesus is God because of what they have found. We need to move quickly so we can answer them. And so the next point I would like to bring to your attention is that the Christians will say that Jesus is God because he received worship. People came and they worshipped him, therefore this has to prove, without a doubt, that Jesus is God. The fact that Jesus accepted uh, worship is offered as the strongest proof of his divinity. They say, well this proves without a doubt, there's no way you guys can, are going to be able to answer this, this has to prove that Jesus is God. But if we go to John's Gospel, uh, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the fourth book, we see in John chapter 9 and verse 38, it says, Lord, I believe, and he worshipped him. Lord, I believe, the man said, and he worshipped him. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 17, it says, they saw him and they worshipped him. So here we see two verses where the word worship is used. The word translated as worshipped in both verses is a Greek word which literally means to kiss like a dog licking after his master's hand. To kiss like a dog 
licking after his master's hands. So this is according to the Strong's Concordance. The Strong Concordance is the one widely used by Christians throughout the world as the most reliable and trustworthy concordance in explaining the Bible. So the word translates actually as to kiss like a dog licking his master's hand. Now if some of you have seen films or you may have seen documentaries of the Catholic Church, you always see that the priest will lay out, put his hand out, and what does the priest do? The other priest does to the, to the bishop or the, whoever it is in the church that lays his hand out. He kisses his hand. The same thing that you'll see in some customs, some French customs, people kiss the lady's hand. You'll see some customs when even when people meet the Queen of England and other, they, they kiss the hand or they don't really kiss it, but they go towards the hand. So that's what it means. Does that mean worship as we mean it when we go into uh, uh, salah when we pray and we worship Allah or does it mean that we simply show respect to a human being so the Bible translators again have purposely chosen to deceive the reader what they've done is they've taken these two verses and instead of putting that the person showed respect by kissing the hand they have changed this word and they said they have worshipped now when it's not split hairs here people will say okay she means the same thing they both he should have said, stop, don't kiss my hand, don't show any sign of respect to me. How do you do that? You should only respect God. This is what the Christian will say to you. This is what the missionary is going to say to you. So let's look at further examples of worship in, in the Bible. We see that one of the books in the Bible, which is my favorite book to, to read, because it has got so many strange um, animals and creatures in here that we've never seen on planet Earth, but that is something that we're not going to talk about today. We can do that in future readings. The book of Daniel is more or less towards the, the end of the Old Testament. And Daniel is one of, the, one of the prophets. Interestingly enough, Daniel was a man who prayed five times a day. So when Christians tell you that, that they don't know where we get the five times prayer a day, this is a common practice we see in the book of Daniel, that Daniel prayed five times a day, almost to the same time that we as modern Muslims follow. But we're going off the topic again. Even the prophet Daniel was worshipped. He did not stop the worship when somebody tried to worship him. And the person who tried to worship Daniel was the king, King Nebuchadnezzar, or King Nebuchadnezzar, depends how you want to pronounce it. The King Nebuchadnezzar fell upon his face and worshiped Daniel. And that's what it says in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 46. This you'll find in the King James Version. Of course, you'll find it in all the other versions, all the other 2001 versions that, that Christians have of the Bible today. You'll find that it says in Daniel chapter 2, verse 46, it says, Then King Nebuchadnezzar fell on his face and worshipped Daniel. So now Daniel has to be, if we go according to the criterion that he allowed worship, he must be the, one of the Trinity or one of the sons of God, or, or at least have some rights to be sitting on judgment on, on, on the Godhead, and you should sit in the kingdom of God. So this is a silly argument, one that doesn't hold any water. If he was not to be worshipped, if Daniel felt that he shouldn't have been worshipped, that he shouldn't have been shown respect, don't you think that he would have stopped it? Don't you think he would have said, no, you cannot worship me, uh, this is not something you're allowed to do? He understood what worship meant. He understood the word worship as used by the, at that period of time. It was mistranslated by the translators of the Bible. That this word worship simply means a sign of respect. And so there was a type of greeting or salutation offered by the king to Daniel to say, I really respect what you are standing for. I really respect the person that you are. So it meant nothing more than that. You cannot read between the lines and start adding things in that are not there. And again, like I said to you, this is a purpose deception, a purposefully made deception. It was driven uh, into, the, into the Bible to make us misunderstand what this actually means. In all modern versions, however, of the account of Daniel being worshipped by King Nebuchadnezzar, this has been changed. You see, what they have done with the New International Version, which I have here, and the King James Version, which I have here, King James Version keeps the word worshipped, and the New International Version has changed the word and removed it and made, had changed the case of it, uh, what it actually means. So they say it wasn't really worshipped, it was this that he showed homage or respect to. However, when it comes to the, the King James Version and the New International Version, neither of them changes that when it comes to relate to the prophet Isa, peace be upon him, or Jesus. When it comes to Jesus, the word worship still remains. So you can't remove it from one and not the other. So this again is shown to be a deliberate deception. The same trick is applied with the word Messiah and Christ, as we saw before. Messiah is a Hebrew word meaning atoned. Its Grecian form is Christ. 
And so the same thing has been done as we saw before. Um, Cyrus the Persian is called the Messiah or the Anointed One in Isaiah chapter 45 and verse 1. And when it comes to the word Christ, we leave the word Messiah. When it comes to talking about uh, the Persian, we call him the Anointed One. But both of the same word is used, both for Christ and Anointed One, yet we keep the one anointed and we keep the other one meaning Messiah. And so this is a deception that has been done deliberately in the hopes to keep us confused. So let's move on to the next point now. The next point is that the Christian will raise is that Jesus is God because he is called Lord and God. They will say he was called Lord and God. Surely this has to now mean that Jesus is God. Surely this has to be the ultimate proof that Christians have from the Bible to prove that Jesus is God. Now an episode is recounted in the 20th chapter of John. So if we go to John, remember it's in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then John. In the 20th chapter of John, a certain Thomas is quoted as saying, My Lord and my God. So Thomas comes up to Jesus and he says, My Lord and my God. Now, an interesting thing is that the Christian maintained that Thomas was addressing Jesus as both, by both of these titles, as Lord and God. The Muslims would have no, no problem with the term Lord. We don't have any problem with you saying Lord, uh, calling Jesus Lord. Lord, 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 we've got no problem with that. But we do have a problem with the second part. So what we see here is again another deception because I'm going to explain to you how the Bible explains the difference between these two words and how it was purposely done wrong. But before I do that, we're going to take a short break. When we get back, inshallah, we'll continue this interesting and exciting topic on who actually is the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, according to the Bible. <laughs> Assalamu alaikum and welcome back to the episode of Who is the Prophet Isa peace be upon him or who is Jesus Christ as referred to in the Bible? Is he somehow divine because he has certain titles given to him? Or is he in fact the Prophet uh, as we as, as Muslims understand him to be? You see the Christians are trying to tell you that the Prophet Isa peace be upon him or Jesus Christ as referred to in the Bible is God. And so we saw that because he, was, he allowed his followers or allowed people according to the Bible to call him Lord and God, this somehow gives him the honor of being God himself. So as we saw that when Thomas referred to Jesus as Lord and God in the Bible, and as we saw in, in, in the verses that we saw before, this somehow must mean that he is God himself. But we see that the word um, Lord is also used by other people in the Bible as well, but we don't ever think that that person is actually that has been referred to as Lord is ever going to be God or is going to be a son of God or is going to be equal to God in any way. So we see that Sarah is calls her husband Abraham by the same title in the Bible because the Bible also refers to, to Sarah and Abraham. And so in 1 Peter 3 and verse 6 she, he says, My Lord, my Lord. But we don't believe that somehow that this word Lord uh, suggests anything further than just the fact that she's showing respect to him. So the suggestion that Thomas addresses Jesus as literally being God is a different matter. We don't claim that at all. Jesus has, has, has already pointed out that the Hebrew scriptures themselves, they point that the, the, the word addressing men as gods is used quite often. So the Hebrew scriptures themselves say to, that the word um, gods or laws and gods is used to refer to normal people. So if you look at, for example, John chapter 10 verse 34 and Psalm 82 verse 6, you'll see that this term is used. However, Paul gave no such rule when Paul, one of the deceivers and one of the uh, corruptors of the Bible, probably the, the person who corrupted the Bible the most, Paul the Apostle, the one who saw the vision on the road and, and claimed that he was to bring a whole new gospel, a whole new Bible. This same Paul, he gave no such rule as, as being allowed to be applied to 1 Corinthians chapter 8 when he says, that there are many lords and many gods, but there is both one God and one Father and one Lord Jesus Christ. Now Paul, the deceiver, the person who came to destroy the whole New Testament, and I'm sorry to any Christian who's watching to say such hard words, but if you want to have a look at the person who, who destroyed your book, you look, need to look no further than Paul. Paul is the person who came and opposed all the teachings of the prophet Isa, peace be upon him. He went against all the teachings of Jesus Christ. And in future episodes, inshallah, we'll be able to look and look at the teachings of Paul and look at the teachings of Jesus and you'll find that every single time they oppose each other and say the exact opposite. So if we look here and we look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, 
the words that are used that says, There are many lords and gods, yet there is but one God, putting him by himself, and one Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ, separating them, saying that they're not one, like many people have tried to say that Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and God are one. Here he's separating them, he's saying that there is only one God, and there is only one Lord Jesus Christ. We believe that, we, we agree with that. We say that there was only one Lord Jesus Christ. We say that there was one, only one Adam. We say that there was only one Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And peace and blessings be upon all the Prophets. So we agree with that statement. You see the Christians try to apply this verse to sort of be an ambiguous thing, to, to confuse us. And so they try to change the expression that, that Thomas was using and somehow make this doctrine more unorthodox than ever before. You see, this is a very unorthodox doctrine that the, the people will try to make here is because they say there is but one God the Father, and one Lord Jesus Christ. Now what is ambiguous about this, and what is confusing about this, and what is unorthodox about this, is that namely that Jesus is not the Father. You see in this verse it says quite clearly that Jesus is the Father, if you accept that this is somehow a Trinitarian verse, if you somehow believe that this verse links together. What you are in fact saying is that Jesus is the Father. Now this would be ridiculous, because then when Jesus was praying before he was going to be crucified according to the Bible, he cries out, my father, our father, or he says, uh, if there's any way for this cup to pass from me, any way for this anguish and this torment to pass from me, let it be so. He speaks to, to his father all the time so that his disciples can hear it. So he's making a big difference between himself and God. However, in this verse, suddenly you would see that Jesus is in fact the father. And this would be ridiculous. This would go against all doctrine of, of Trinitarians and all, all Christians out there. So this doesn't work. You cannot apply this this way. So this ancient heresy that has been um, branded in the church or branded by the church as, as a way to describe um, Jesus being God, this is ridiculous. The impossibility of this happening is apparent because if, you put the, if this becomes part of the doctrine, everything else uh, falls apart. So the distinction between the Father and the Son is essential to the doctrine of the Trinity. If the Father and the Son are in fact the same one, then you don't have a Trinity, you only have two people in the Trinity, and that would be God and Jesus who are one and then you'd have the Holy Spirit. But as we've seen, we've got thousands of characters now belonging to the Trinity because Israel is part of the Trinity, David is part of the Trinity, and so many other candidates as well that are part of the Trinity. So the, the distinction is blurred again when we look at John chapter 14 and verse 9. In John chapter 14 and verse 9, we see the presses that it's even more pressing here that we see that Jesus replies to a man named Philip, and he says to this man, Philip, that he who has seen me has seen the Father. He says to Philip, he who has seen me has seen the Father. So this is a big problem because now Jesus is again showing, if, if we're going to go strictly according to what the, the Bible says, that Jesus and God the Father are the same. And this is a problem because the Trinitarians cannot have that to be because then there's a person missing from the Trinity. You see, when the voice came from heaven, when Jesus is baptized according to the Bible and it says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased, we almost have a schizophrenia taking place. Jesus is talking to himself. He is both the father and the son at the same time. He's, he's sitting there or he's standing in the water about to be baptized by John the Baptist. A dove flies over who is a supposed leader of the Holy Spirit. And a voice from heaven says, this is my son with whom I'm well pleased. If Jesus is the father, who's talking? Where is this voice coming from? Is it coming from the clouds? Is it coming from imagination? What is the story? So there's a problem. So Trinitarians have a great problem with these verses. And you're welcome to ask them, speak to them and say to them, please explain these verses to me because we don't understand them. You see, a strict literary explanation would mean that an unacceptable doctrine of Jesus being the Father would be applied here. And so the interpreters say that the Father is, is here equivalent to God is, is not so. So the, the people try to change it. They've tried to read into it and they've tried to put other things. However, we cannot possibly be obliged to understand that Jesus meant here that what he was saying is exactly the same as him being God. Jesus here was applying a status, a, a, a position, just like we would say that um, somebody acts like a father or somebody uh, is our Lord who, who guides us and helps us. Um, in the court system, we call when we go to court, some, some countries we call him our Lord. We don't believe that for any mo moment in time that that judge or that, that baron or that baroness or whoever it is is somehow our, our God or Creator. 
Lord is just a, a, a status of somebody of respect. We call our person that we hire our property from, our landlord. We don't believe that he somehow sits up in heaven. And the word God is also referred to many times. That's why we as Muslims prefer the word Allah. Because it cannot have many meanings. It can only be a meaning for one God. It cannot be many, meant for other gods. You know, we have at our house, we have, we call them security gods. Even though the word is spelled G-U-A, and, but the word sounds like God. So we don't have that mixed up when it comes to Islam. We only have one Allah. We don't have Allah God. We only have one God, Allah. And so it's very easy for us. We don't get mixed up. We don't have all these problems. And it is reported that Jesus said, Before Abraham was, I am. So if you read John chapter 8, verse 58, it says, Before Abraham was, I am. Now for the Jew, the word I am can only be to describe God. A Jew will never end a sentence, or a Hebrew I should say, will never end a sentence with the word I am. I am can only be referring to as God. Even if Jesus meant here to claim that these words that he was alive before Abraham was, is this sufficient ground to prove that Jesus was divine or that he was equal to God? Even if Jesus existed before Abraham, even if he existed before, is that enough evidence? Can we say that this is enough evidence to say that Jesus is in fact divine or God? If Jesus lived in heaven, then came to earth, it might mean that something remarkable happened, that something supernatural happened. If Jesus, in fact, lived before he came to earth, and he was in heaven for that period of time, this would be remarkable. But is that going to be enough to prove that Jesus was, in fact, God, or a divine creature, or a divine being? Inshallah, we'll continue in this series in the next episode and we'll continue to look as is Jesus God because of what the Bible texts say you see we have to look very carefully of what the text says and we have to look at the text against the text and we find that the Bible proves itself wrong many times because people have taken these verses out of context that were never applied that never had anything to do with what the Christians say they had to do with one of the wonderful things that the, we read in the Quran is that the first words that were to, given to the Prophet Muhammad وسلم, was read. And again the word was given read. And again it was given read. Because so few people read. We go to the text and we want to put our own version or own interpretation into it. And no one does it better than the Christians do it. Where they go to the text and they do not read. They do not read. They do not read. They go with their own ideas and try to find a verse to make it fit. To make it fit what they had in their mind before they came to the text. So next week or next time we come together, remember we are going to learn to read what the text says. And hopefully, inshallah, if Allah wills, we will be able to understand more on the personality and the character of the Prophet Isa, peace be upon him, as he is truly meant to be seen. And not the way people want us to see him in this book, the Bible. We look forward to seeing you again in future episodes. And from me, Assalamu Alaikum. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm.